assumed I would conceive naturally when John and I decided to start a family. I didn't. We turned to fertility drugs with ambivalence. Reports of the mood swings the drugs sometimes caused worried me. I had only gone through one round when I broke a wooden dish drying rack over John's head. I don't remember what he said, but I'm sure it was something I'd otherwise have considered innocuous. Instead, a growling, uncontrollable rage emerged from nowhere and then overcame me like an emotional tsunami. We decided the drugs weren't for us. I had gone along with fertility treatments for the same reason I went along with other non-decisions of made in my life, like having an enormous wedding, because people whom I loved wanted it for me. I thought I was supposed to want it, just like I was supposed to want to get pregnant by any means. Yet I cried genuine tears when, month after month, I was unable to conceive. I felt like a failure. My friend Lisa, a scholar of the Bible, sat with me once as I confessed that another fertility treatment had failed to take. This is your pain, she said. You must bear witness. Her words gripped me physically. I stopped crying. I was erect, alert and full of purpose. From that moment, I paid attention to the more important presence in my insides, not the drugs but the little door in my heart that had always been closed to them. Behind that door was my truest self and she didn't want to conceive that badly. Not long ago, I read an interview with a famous actress who adopted two children. When the subject of pregnancy came up, the actress said something like, it didn't interest me. It wasn't that pregnancy didn't interest me at all, it just didn't interest me enough. Adoption, however, came naturally. One day I woke up and I knew. It hit me like a revelation. We were going to adopt, I told John, and then Lisa. We were going to adopt from Ethiopia. There is a notable Ethiopian-born population in Vermont, where we live, and a substantial number of them are adopted children. But to me the decision felt less practical than magical. I'm the kind of person who typically questions her instincts. In this case, I did not. Sometimes people assume my husband and I adopted for altruistic purposes. In truth, we adopted for the same reason that people pursue natural birth, because it was what we wanted. As it turns out, I am selfish. Adopting my daughters is the most self-centered thing I have ever done. It is the one decision I have made in my life that represents who I truly am, the only choice that aligns most squarely with my deepest and most fundamental belief about life on earth, that we are here to see one another through this journey. We are here to keep our brothers, our sisters, too. Isabella left, and Julia at home with John and Emily Bernard. Photograph. Courtesy Emily Bernard. Once we decided to adopt, signs seemed to spring up everywhere. I was sitting in a waiting room and opened a magazine at an article written by a woman who had adopted as a last resort and then conceived a second child naturally. Her greatest fear about adoption, she wrote, had been that she would not be able to bond with her child as intensely and authentically as a natural mother, that the bond between herself and her daughter would be, at best, only an approximation of that natural bond, or, at worst, simply counterfeit. She discovered that they were different, her relationships with each of her two children, but the most fundamental difference between being the mother of an adopted child and being the mother of a biological child, she said, was that she was able to take public pleasure in the beauty of the child she had adopted. When strangers said of her adopted child, what a beautiful baby. She could respond, without hesitation, yes, she is, isn't she? But when strangers exclaimed over her biological child, she fumbled for a response. To agree, she explained, felt like vanity. I hold her story in my heart. I was on the phone waiting for a picture I had forwarded to my friend Iris to open on her computer screen. I knew the picture intimately. It featured two brown babies with enormous eyes. One of them was in tears, the other looked like she was trying not to laugh. Both of them were wearing crocheted yellow caps that made me think of the 1940s swimming champion and actress Esther Williams. Before we heard about the girls, John and I had never considered the possibility of twins. As the picture opened slowly on Iris's screen, she and I discussed this unexpected factor and all of the challenges it would present. When it finally opened, Iris went quiet. Then she said, oh, you are fucked. We were, indeed, happily fucked. There was no turning back. But what we assumed would be a straight line from us to the babies in the picture turned out to have close shaves and hair-raising detours. At one point, it looked like the adoption would fall through. John and I were in Ethiopia at the time. A government official told us to prepare ourselves for the worst. That night John and I held each other and sobbed.
I was more terrified that night than I have ever been in my life. The anguish seemed to have no bottom to it. I thought of the baby 